When you have a product layout, your facility is laid out similar to your process flow diagram. That is, each workstation or location within your facility is laid out so that it follows the order in which your materials uh, are turned into your finished product. So the steps that you follow in your process flow diagram uh, become the order that your facility is laid out in. In this case, because we are following essentially the process flow diagram, we could think, out our, think about our facility being laid out into workstations that are essentially equivalent to the steps we would follow in our production. So the question is, is what activities do we do at each of these workstations? We recognize with the product layout that we are going to follow a fixed path material handling. That is, as we make a product such as a table, that table is going to go through each of these stations. And so the question is, is what part of the assembly of the product, like a table, happens at each location? So to help us make this decision, we are doing what's called assembly line balancing. And so let's look at the steps to making a table. We place the top subassembly, so the top of the table, on our work surface. We're going to place a leg subassembly onto that top and insert a screw. We then insert a second screw. Then we have a second leg assembly that will be attached to the tabletop with a screw. And then we add another screw. And so you can see the steps followed here. Now, when we do assembly line balancing, the first step in your assembly line balancing is to create a precedence network. This looks at the order of your operation, similar to your process flow diagram. But here we are identifying the relationship between the activities. So as we look at our table example here, we recognize that first thing we need to do is flip over the tabletop. That's going to be the first thing in our precedence network. Then we're going to place a leg subassembly onto the top of that table. So activity B must come after activity A. Activity C was to screw in a second screw attaching that subassembly to the tabletop. So C happens after B. If we go back here and look at D, we can see that we place another leg subassembly and attach it to the top. So activity D simply needs to happen after activity A. So we need to flip over the tabletop before we can add a leg. It doesn't matter which leg you add first. So you see B and D both come after A. D also will need a second screw, and so E comes after D. Activity F says to place a leg brace between these two leg subassemblies. So activity F is going to have to happen after both C and E. Activity G says we're going to insert another screw to hold what we put into F. So G will come after F. H is another leg brace. So in order to put in a leg brace, you're going to need the legs. And it doesn't matter which leg brace you put on first. So H and F, either one of them can be done. They both have to be done after C and E. I is the next screw. So let's go I. And J is then to tighten all the screws. So here we have our precedence network. The next thing we need to do is determine the cycle time. That is, how much time can a single table spend at each workstation? So our cycle time, or talk time as it's also called, can be found by looking at our demand, our forecasted demand, and let's forecast that our demand is 480 units per day. And let's also assume that our company operates eight hours a day. So to find the cycle time or talk time, we need to figure out how much time per unit. That's what we're trying to figure out. 
Now in the example we're looking at, these times here are all in seconds. So instead of finding out how many hours or fractions of hours per unit, let's turn them into seconds. So to do that calculation, we're going to take our eight hours in a day, multiply it times the 60 minutes in an hour, and the 60 seconds in an hour. And then divide the whole thing by the 480 units in a day. So what we end up with is that we cannot spend more than 60 seconds per table at each workstation. So the next step in our process is going to be to figure out how many workstations we're going to need. So to do this, to figure out the number of workstations, so step three, we need to look at those activities and how long they take. So activity A takes 4 seconds, B takes 20, C takes 13, D takes 20, E takes 13, F takes 20, G takes 13, H takes 20, I takes 13, J takes 32. If we add them all together, the total, so that's the sum of all of the time, is 168 seconds. According to our cycle time, we can only spend 60 seconds per table at each workstation. So if it takes 168 seconds to do all of the steps, and we can't spend more than 60 seconds at a single workstation, then we would need 2.8 workstations. Problem with this is you can't have 2.8 workstations. So we need three stations. If you calculated that you needed 2.001 workstations, you still need to add to round up to three. Okay, so always round up. Now that we've figured out that we have three stations, so think about it as three locations within our facility. So here's the three areas in our facility. The question is, is which of those activities happen at each location? So we need to assign the tasks. To assign the tasks, so step four, assign tasks. We need to figure out the task and we need to look at how much time it takes. So let's start with activity A, which takes four seconds and that will start at workstation one. Next, we're following the precedence network. So we're looking at which of these activities has the most number of followers. A had the most number of followers, so we started with it. And now we have B and D, which both have the same number of activities that go after it. So it doesn't matter whether you choose B or D, and we can just go with B here. So we'll choose activity B, and activity B takes 20 seconds. So we've now used 24 of the 60 seconds at activity, or sorry, at workstation one, which means we still have time for additional tasks. We go back to our process flow diagram and we're looking at C or D. Well, D has more followers, more activities that come after it. So we choose D, not C. So let's add activity D. And activity D takes 20 seconds. Okay, so now we've used up 44 of the 60 seconds at workstation one, and we go back to our precedence network, and we would either add C or E, doesn't matter which one. Let's look at their times. C takes 13 seconds, and E takes 13 seconds. So we just choose one. Let's choose C. So now we have 40, 53, 57 seconds used up. And since there is no more room to add another activity, we're gonna have three seconds of idle time. Okay. Which means the next activity now has to be at workstation number two. In order for us to meet that forecast demand, 
this partially completed table needs to move on to the next location so that we can start a new table here at workstation one and we can keep producing enough to meet that forecast demand. So we have A, B, C, and D already loaded, A, B, C, and D, and now we're going to load E. So let's go here and let's put in E, and E takes 13 seconds. We go back to our precedence network. Now we need to add F or H because they both have the same number of followers doesn't matter which one you add. We'll go here, F takes 20 seconds and H takes 20 seconds. So let's start with F. And that is 33 seconds out of our 60, so we can also add to it H. So let's add H here and H was also 20 seconds, so this is 53 out of the 60 seconds. We now go here at our precedence network and we need to add G or I. So let's look at G and I. G takes 13, I takes 13, and if we look at how much we have left in workstation two, we'll notice that neither one of them will fit at workstation two, we don't have an additional 13 seconds to spare. So we total these up. We have 40, 53 seconds here, which means we have seven seconds of idle time. And it means that the next activity, which was G and I, need to happen at the third workstation. So here's G, here's I. G was 13 seconds, I was 13 seconds. That takes up 26 seconds. And the last activity, J, took 32 seconds. Let's make sure that all fits into 60 seconds at a workstation. 32 plus 13, so that's 45, plus we have 58 here, which leaves two seconds of idle time. So we have assigned tasks to our three workstations. If you are finding that when you assign the tasks, you are ending up with more workstations than you calculated in part three, then you should check and make sure uh, that your workstations have been properly allocated. Make sure that you are putting them in order uh, based on that precedence network, starting with the ones that have the most followers. We want to add up how much idle time we have and so we can see how efficient this is. So if we add up our idle time, that's three seconds plus the seven seconds plus the two seconds, we have total idle time of 12 seconds. To figure out our percentage idle time, We're going to take that 12 seconds and divide it by our three workstations times the 60 seconds that each workstation can have a table. So we have 12 seconds divided by 180 seconds and we end up with a fraction. Well, because we want it in terms of percentage, we need to make sure that we multiply it times 100. So 12 seconds divided by 180 seconds times 100, we end up with 6.7% idle. So how efficient are we? Efficiency can be found by taking 100 minus that percentage idle. And so we find out that this has 93.3% efficiency. So we have allocated the tasks so that we can meet our forecast demand and we have done it with 93.3% efficiency. If you have variability in your task time, so you notice here we knew exactly how long each task took, but if there was some variation in these numbers, maybe this ranged and said from 13 seconds to 13 to 15 seconds, then you need to recognize that in your assembly line balancing and you are going to need to allow for more idle time. 
which may mean additional workstations. So you have to build in a little bit of a buffer if there is more variability. If you have a particular bottleneck within your production line that is slowing down the process. So if we go back and here are the workstations. If this is a bottleneck, then this is going to slow down all of the other activities. And so you should consider having parallel processing. Is it possible, because of this bottleneck slowing everything down, to have two of them? And so then we can maintain the amount we're producing at the other workstations and keep that higher capacity rather than our capacity being limited by that bottleneck.